wanted to make a few opening remarks on both the organizer making opening remarks and then I'll do my opening talk. So when I go to my opening talk, I've asked uh, Professor Walt Loveland here to keep time on me because I don't trust myself to stay within the time limits. And ACS is very firm about these things. Uh, well, planning for this symposium was begun more than two years ago when Greg asked me to organize something on heavy elements for the fall 2000 ACS meeting in Washington. Well, it seemed like a long ways away, and anything two years away I'll usually agree to, but these things have a way of catching up with you. The original plan was to focus on exciting new results and discoveries on the chemical and nuclear properties of the heaviest elements, which had been <coughs> taking place with the age of ideal place for such a symposium. It'd be convenient for our foreign colleagues and also uh, for uh, those of us who live in the U.S. It was also felt that it might attract some attention from DOE and other government agencies with special interest in these elements, but I don't think it has. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I, at least in so I don't see them here. Um, originally, it was not planned Originally, it was not planned as a symposium to honor Glenn Seaborg, and it, but rather as a symposium on chemical and nuclear properties of the heaviest elements, and I had actually asked him if he would give an opening <coughs> five minutes or so introduction to this symposium. So after his untimely death in February 1999, I asked the DMCC officers and the program committee if I could organize Although we had a memorial uh, session at Anaheim in the spring of 1999, that didn't really take the place of a scientific symposium in his memory. And so uh, it seemed that having this in Washington would be an appropriate thing since he spent 10 years of his life, 61 to 71 years, <coughs> as chairman of the ABC. And the San Francisco meeting in March So um, it seems especially fitting to dedicate this symposium to the memory of our colleague, friend, and mentor, Glenn Seaborg, discoverer of 10 transuranium elements up here, plutonium through 102 Nobel, winner of the Nobel Prize in Chemistry. Then nuclear properties uh, in the after beginning in the afternoon, and on into Tuesday morning. <coughs> I should say that uh, Peter Mueller, who was to give the opening talk at nine o'clock on Tuesday, has been called back to Sweden because of the death of his mother. So the slot from nine o'clock to nine thirty-five will be open on Tuesday. We're not allowed to put another speaker in, but we can use it as a discussion time. So
So I will sh I'm supposed to show up here at 9 o'clock anyway, and if I still have 50 slides and photos to show, <laughs> we can show them then because uh, my colleague Diana Weeden has been <coughs> calling through all of Seaworth's slides here like Mr. Cullen gave to me to take care of. And so we have uh, many of them you've seen, many of the slides, but many of them you may not have. And so I will get to maybe only 98 out of the 100 this morning. Thank you. 
accredited as the Corn of his class in 1929 with the French Museum, which shows him his high school graduation. He found summer employment as a feed door and then found a nice laboratory assistant job in the fire cell tire and rubber company. <laughs> I bet they didn't have credits to sell off. <laughs> this helped him earn money for his freshman year at UCLA. UCLA was a tuition free public university, or he wouldn't have been able to go. And his earnings made it just pos fairly possible for him to enter college in that depression year of 1929. He could live at home and uh, commute with friends for some 20 miles to UCLA. I should say that after leaving Michigan, his father, who was a machinist, was never able to find permanent employment, and so the family was exceedingly poor. He commuted with friends, and you'll see him in the middle of the back row. In the middle of the front row, you see Sam Thompson, who he met as uh, a boy in Los Angeles area, and he was a lifelong friend and colleague after that. <coughs> During, this shows when he ready to go on a, a camping or a hiking trip, I guess. That's about 1933. And this shows him in 1934, about the time he graduated from UCLA. And I've been trying to figure that picture out. I think his, his leg, his knee is that long. It goes all the way up here to the side down. <laughs> I mean, it's incredible. Now you can imagine how he felt on airplanes. Um, anyway, he uh, finished his degree in chemistry in 1934 and stayed on a fifth year, 33-34, to take a number of courses in physics, which had just that year been started at the graduate level at UCLA. Um, but because graduate work had not yet been instituted in the Department of Chemistry at UCLA, Glenn then went to Berkeley to pursue graduate work in chemistry. And uh, he decided to choose chemistry as a profession rather than physics because he felt if he couldn't get a position as a university professor, which was his aim in life at that time, he could always get a job as a chemist easier than as a physicist. Now, I don't know. That's probably true still, although I don't want to insult our physicist friends. Besides that, I'm happy to be on this one. Anyway, Glenn then went uh, to, he wanted to work with the great professor Gilbert Eaton Lewis, dean of the College of Chemistry. He also wanted to be near the rising young nuclear physicist Ernest Orlando Lawrence, inventor of the cyclotron in the early 30s. And uh, so he went on to graduate school at Berkeley. And uh, I have to say that even at this early age, Ben Glenn showed himself to be an amazingly good judge of professional talent, uh, picking D.M. Lewis, Ernest Lawrence, and all the other luminaries that were around in Berkeley at that time. This is his uh, college graduation with his PhD. And those of you who've gone to graduations at Berkeley, many of you have, recognize the same old, he still has the same old gowns and the same, <laughs> I think. Um, Seymour described the atmosphere that existed at the University of California, Berkeley, when he entered the graduate student in August 34, as exciting and glamorous, and he took formal courses in chemistry from many of the professors. So he actually got his PhD in chemistry in the spring of 37 with the thesis on the inelastic scattering of fast neutrons, which sounds more like a physics thesis than a chemistry th uh, thesis, but in those days it was hard to tell the difference. It was the depth of the depression he couldn't he really hadn't thought about what he was going to do. After he got his PhD, he just felt something would turn up, and indeed it did. Lewis hired him 